Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. The median life expectancy for a man living in the United States, somebody just like me, is roughly 80 years. That works out to 960 months, 4,160 weeks, or about 29,000 days. I'm sneaking up on 35 years old, which means on average I've got about 45 years or 540 months left. When you're in the middle of them, it's easy for the days to blur together. But putting the time that we have left into simple numbers can be both a bit overwhelming and remarkably clarifying. Our time's limited, and how we use it is up to us. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about coming to terms with death and dying, the reality of our limited time, and how we can perhaps use that knowledge to refine our focus and live a more fulfilling life. To help us do that, I'm joined as usual by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So, Dad, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well today, Forrest, and I'm extremely interested in this topic. Yeah, this was one that you put out there as a potential yeah. one to do, so I'm looking forward yeah. to some of your takes on it. Before we get into it, I do want to give people a couple of quick reminders. First, remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it right now. That really helps us out. And then second, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast, and for the cost of just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. Then finally, I'd also like to let you know about a new and fairly topical offering from Rick. On August 13th and 14th, Rick is going to be offering a live online two-day workshop on grief and loss. He's going to be exploring what we can do to relate to both ordinary and more traumatic forms of loss, and then offering a variety of reparative practices focused on healing from these very painful experiences. If you like the podcast, I think you'll love it. And I've included a link to learn more in the description of today's episode. If you do decide to register for the course, use code BEINGWELL25 to get 25% off. So, Dad, you're almost exactly twice as old as I am. And I'm already looking at the about 540 months that I've got left. Hopefully more, hopefully more, but who knows. And I'm getting a little squirmy about it, not gonna lie. <laughs> so I'd like to start by just asking you, as somebody who's closer to the end than I am, how you think yeah. about this? And maybe, I don't know, how your relationship with death has changed over time. It's a great topic because it goes to uh, what we wanna make of the life that we have. It also goes to how we feel about other people eventually no longer being here. And it goes to our views and our deep intuitions even, or experiences of the nature of the cosmos and reality. It's a huge topic, huge topic. I, I think it's really helpful to kind of bring it down to the personal. Okay, for you, the person, where are you at about knowing that you're going to die one day? And also personally, how do you feel and where are you at about others you care about dying one day? Uh, there's uh, these Tibetan uh, Buddhism questions, five questions that are just great reflections. Is it given to me to avoid aging? Is it given to me to avoid illness? Is it given to me to avoid death? Is it given to me to be separated one way or another from all that I hold dear? at various times? And is it given to me to escape the results of my deliberate actions? Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. I'm not gonna give you the <laughs> right answer <but laughs> because it's really about a reflection, but those are deep, deep, deep inquiries. Right? Yeah. And we can engage them with a whole heart, with courage, and with gratitude for all that we've been given so far, with compassion for ourselves, compassion for others who may well have a harder life than ours, including um, facing very unjust premature deaths. And, you know, we can, we can be big enough to grapple with this, right? But it definitely is, this is one of the big ones. So I just kind of want to name that going in. Yeah, for sure. To ask you maybe a question about it, which gets to the changing relationship aspect of that. The more that I've learned about psychology and mental health and just seeing stuff in my own life, the more that I've come to believe that 
everything is a Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It all starts with acceptance, essentially, you know, reflecting on nature, coming to terms yeah. with reality. Yeah. Um, so maybe what's helped you come to terms with that a little bit? So this is my 70th lap around the sun. And I have had both of my parents die. I've had a very close friend die. Uh, I've come very close to dying myself on at least four occasions uh, in wilderness. It's been, you know, I've had some encounters there. For myself, as you say, it's kind of sobering to take a look at the actuarial t tables and realize the median expectation for an American male of my age is about 15 more years. Whoa. That sounds all too finite, you know? How do I feel about that? I've never been someone who had a deeply emotional fear of what might lie beyond death. Mm. And so, yeah. some people do, some people do, and that's part of the normal range. Death has not been an issue for me. For me, it's been more like, I don't want to go. Same. Yeah, totally I'm still trying same. to learn yeah. stuff. I'm interested. What's up tomorrow? I like seeing my sweetie. I love my cat. It's good, you know? So that's kind of how it's been more for me. And then to kind of move past the cliche aspects of this and to try to get at something that does justice to the soulful profundity of this topic, I'll be frank. Uh, there are two things that have really helped me. And I'm not saying that they would necessarily help other people. I would say three things, really. The first is that I understand the necessity for death, for life to proceed. Mm. If individuals within a species did not die, that species could not evolve. And uh, if individuals in that species did not die, they would gradually crowd out the niches of their habitat so that no more young ones could be born. It would be stifling and stagnant. And this might sound way conceptual, but it's a way to just sort of understand that if you want to have the gift of living, it must also include dying. This reality, there's a kind of bedrock realism about it. Not fatalism, but just, yep, that's what it is. So the second thing is that I have had a fortunate life in many, many ways. And um, that's part of, that relates in part to what I'm about to say, but it's also been a life with a fair amount of emotional pain and suffering and issues and losses and sadness. And all that said, I feel like on the day I was born, reality threw me a party. <laughs> so then I'm, the day I was born, I come out, you know, and like, what? <laughs> Lights, sounds, weird people, they're poking me. Ah, you know, well, I can hardly understand what's going on. So what a party, which includes a certain amount of pain, discomfort, you know, but it's like, wow. And then whoop, the next morning I wake up, pow, it's another party moving me around. What's up? I'm gradually starting to kind of sort of comprehend what's happening very slowly, right? I'm an infant here, but wow, another party. And so reality then just has been throwing me one birthday party after another. Each day is a birth. That's my birthday party today. And I'm not denying or bringing in any kind of rose-colored glasses to the parts that have been really hard. Uh, my heart is heavy, actually, a lot these days about the state of the world and with a very growing intimacy of compassion for billions of people on our planet who are in a really tough situation and it's going to get worse due to climate change and other things before it gets better, most likely. So that's very real for me. So I'm not denying any bit of that. Then add to that, of all the sentient beings with a nervous system, let's say, that have ever existed or been born on our own little rocky planet, you know, third rock out from the sun. Um, what a great fortune it is to have a human body. Not perfect, but man, would you rather be a human or a flea? <laughs> I'd rather be a human. Uh, and then you throw in, would you rather be a human today? If you could roll the dice and play the lottery of being born at any time, 
throughout, you know, for the last 300,000 years, when would you like to be born? And in a real way, like in you're stuck with it. Okay, you're stuck with it. It's not like you're going to be a tourist in the Stone Age, you know, and then you're going to leave like in a sci-fi novel. No, you're stuck. Most people, me included, would be really glad to play the odds of being born in 2023 rather than, you know, 1023 or 2023 years, you know, BC, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, I, I just feel incredibly grateful and um, I just am gobsmacked, awestruck gratitude, like, wow, the universe came together to form these planets and, and life and all the weird contingencies that had to occur in the shooting gallery of their early solar system for you and me to be talking here right now, Forrest. And then eventually it will be the last party. Yeah. And I'm going to want there to be one more after that probably. But you know, that last party is in the context of, you know, probably 30,000 before it. Thank you, reality. And that helps me be a lot more at ease. It's in the context of this extraordinary streaming of gifts that we're all receiving continuously that, okay, at some point the gifts will stop. You're speaking essentially to gratitude and appreciation mm -hmm. of life as yeah. something that makes you feel more comfortable about the reality of life ending to a degree. Yeah. And um, I just kind of want to ask you about that because I think that's not necessarily obvious for people. There are a lot of people who probably have pretty good lives where an awareness of the goodness of their life makes them want to hang on to it more. Or uh, there might be people who have pretty uncomfortable lives, but uh, a feeling one way or the other for what could potentially await them in the dark unknown is also quite terrifying. So I think it's interesting, actually, and it's worth pointing out that gratitude for you is a direct, oh, this actually makes me feel more okay about that. Because I, I don't think that that's inherent in it. And I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. And then this also goes to how we can live in a way that we become increasingly comfortable with our, our inevitable exit from the stage. And it goes to a, a, a saying on a tombstone I once heard about, um, he lived until he died or she lived or they lived until they died. So I'm glad you stopped me there. And, yeah, and I'm not sure if there's a question in there or not, but it, it just was interesting to me. Oh, yeah. So if you're so grateful for life, wouldn't you want to keep going? Sure, yeah. And on the other hand, if your life has had issues in it, um, how can you be grateful for it? Part of what helps me about this is an understanding of the improbable contingencies that had to come together to enable any single life. You, you know, in the scale of the universe, all kinds of stuff, the, the, the layers and layers of good fortune. And then if you just really get also how incredible it is to have experiences. Nobody had, I mean, life was here for nearly 3 billion years before any creature had an experience, hmm. right? Of pleasure or pain, raw sensation in the primordial seas 600 million years ago. Like, wow. And then you think about the complexity of human experiences distinct from those of crabs or spiders, right? Wow. And all this might sound too much like Science Friday, but it's staring it in our face. We don't notice it because, oh, I'm having experiences. Thank you, Captain Obvious. No, it's incredible that you're hearing anything right now. That's amazing. It's amazing that you have a nervous system that can detect variations in my intonations, you know, that can tell the difference between warmth and someone trying to sell you a car. Wow. <laughs> if you're not going, wow, you're not paying attention deeply enough you know so there's i guess that yeah. that shapes my perspective yeah i guess what i'm asking is how do you appreciate that without getting attached to it right well now you know? we're in again deep territory um you know my latest rant has been dukkha without tanha so there uh dukkha being <laughs> a poly word you know uh for three attributes of reality one that there is sometimes discomfort, pain, unpleasant. Second, all that is pleasant will end someday. And third, there's an inherent dynamic instability of all material and mental phenomena. Okay, but that's not necessarily suffering. What makes it suffering is craving broadly, 
getting caught up in drivenness, pressure, aversion, grasping, greed, hatred, with a lot of selfing along the way. So one way to relate to this is to cultivate um, on one side of the coin, non-attachment, loosening the grip, becoming more aware of and free of and regulating regarding uh, tanha, craving. And on the other side of the coin, really, really internalizing the good mm. so it sinks in. So it feels increasingly like it's, it's in you. Yeah, when your body dies, it will probably die as well. It won't be here because it's causes and conditions, the emotional memory of all the good you've taken in won't be here anymore. But you paradoxically, as you feed yourself and you cultivate contentment, to be able to say authentically, I am content in the present. Yeah. Knowing that there can still be goal-directed action, there can still be skillful effort to deal with threats well, in, that moves through a field in which you can authentically say, I am content, right? And that's a cultivation. It's That's been a real sustained practice for me, especially the last dozen or so years to really go after contentment as an incredibly interesting and powerful trait, which releases a lot of harmful desire, for harmful for yourself and for others. Yeah, and I don't want to spend too much time here just because this is a topic that we've covered in, in other episodes of the podcast. Yeah. So you're welcome yeah, to go right. back through and take a look at some of those other episodes that have, uh, for instance, the episode on existential dread that we did had some of this in it. Uh, we more recently did a um, an episode on attachment and cultivating non-attachment, which did shockingly well. It was one of those episodes that I, I didn't think would necessarily do super well because it felt a little... You know, it's a little bit more focused or a little more fringe, but it was really cool to see the uh, the kind of response that it got. But I know that another part of this that has been helpful for you and, and helpful for me as well to a degree as I've gotten older and become a little bit more contemplative in my nature, I'm still very much an agnostic, but you know, some of these practices I've definitely taken on personally, is a growing sense of the difference between an egoic identity, this is my ego self, and more of a sense of just reality as a whole, or being a part of something. Uh, the the metaphor that you I've heard you use a lot is the difference between the wave and the water, and it shows up in your book Neurodharma as well. Where yes, the wave is a piece of the ocean, but it is also, you know, the ocean itself, and it is also a wave. It is all of these things at the same time. And so when we're trapped in a relatively narrow sense of the ego, that's probably going to be gone when you die. I mean, of course, we don't know, but. That's what I would bet on, that the ego identity is out the window. But the, all the other things keep on going. So even though there is a kind of ending, maybe it's really more of a return. And I think that as long as somebody like me, who has a pretty loose holding of anything resembling an afterlife or anything like that, I, it can be helpful just to think in terms of the ongoing nature of things. I look forward to talking more with you about this, Forrest. Um, I want to say first that... I've had a couple of, like I said, I've had four situations, two in the mountains, one underwater, and one horsing around with some friends as a kid, in which I could have died or broken my neck and been paralyzed forever. Um, basically, in those episodes, but also when I've had, for example, a skin cancer taken out many years ago, I'm fine. But there was a 10-day period, roughly, where I didn't know where this was going to go, and I knew it was a virulent cancer that needed to be removed immediately. In the episodes where you know I, I uh, nearly died, every bit of me wanted to live. The mm -hmm. animal body wanted to live. And when I had the cancer, there was like my mind was sort of three levels. Top level was problem solving. Underneath the problem solving level was it felt like a little scared furry animal that just wanted to curl up and be hugged, curl up in the cave and be hugged. Uh, and that is very important for people to include when we face these things. If you get the willies, when you see obituaries in passing, you know, if hospitals creep you out or whatever it might be, um, it's normal. If you're, if you're worried about your health, uh, if you're scared about the future, uh, these are normal things and they're very important to include. The, the, the body, the animal body does not want to go. Okay. We can accept that, we can feel it, we can allow it, 
It might be uncomfortable, but we don't have to suffer it. It's natural. Of course, we want to keep going. And then the third layer underneath all that, in my, you know, when I, um, the skin cancer dealt with, was honestly profound inner peace. I, I'm really happy to say that when the chips were down, this happened about eight, nine years ago, I think, there really was that level of total inner peace. And uh, I wish that for people. And I think people can appreciate all three of those layers can be cooking away, right? I think you said it really well. If you have a growing felt recognition, it's conceptual, but it's also visceral, that you are an eddy in the stream, when you start having a sense of the boundaries blurring, the edges softening between you and all, you, you get a sense more and more that reality is streaming through you. You are in the phrase from the wonderful, wonderful, deep, deep, brilliant thinker, Evan Thompson. Uh, one of his genius books is Mind in Life. Um, you realize you're a standing streaming, like a standing wave, and yet you're also a streaming. And he, he, it's sort of like, well, it, that's what I was all along anyway. And if this particular streaming fades or the boulders that, you know, the causes and conditions that kind of shape it happening here and they get dislodged and it's, you were never nothing but water all along. This makes no sense, but I'm going to say it. I was never even here. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I, I to, to relate to that a bit, I've had people ask me like, are you, are you afraid of death? And my response most of the time is, well, I'm not really afraid of being dead, but I am a bit afraid of not being alive. And the reason for that is because I, I was dead for 13 billion years and I didn't feel a darn thing. You know, so like, what's, what's, what's the difference? To your point, we were always already here. We were never here in the first place. However you want to kind of frame it, it was just, it was something else. So that's a bit how I relate to it to maybe move a little bit from the existential parts of these and the kind of theoretical consideration of it to how we can use this kind of a consideration in a positive way to get a bit more out of life. Returning the, to the acceptance piece, we have an extremely death avoidant culture. People don't like going to the hospital. People don't like living near a cemetery. Maybe a bit more on the nose, we've had a million people die of COVID in the United States since the pandemic began, and uh, people, by and large, kind of just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that part of this is about developing a greater intimacy with the reality of death, thinking about it different kinds of ways. Like I, I like the exercise of the numbers that I did at the beginning of the podcast, really getting granular about how many more days do you have, you know, because they just keep on going and going and going. And then you look at a number like, a hundred months or 500 months or something like that. And you kind of go, whoa, okay. You know, this just got really real over here about how do I want to spend those 500 months, right? And, but we can only do that if we, if we have the acceptance piece. We can only go through this process if we're like, yes, this is reality. And then we can have more of an active choice in terms of what we can do about it or what we want to do about it. Beautifully said. Also, I was just, reflecting here a bit, when we're rested in love, the fear of dying tends to fade, in my experience. We're so in the present and we're just lived by love. We're buoyed by it, we're supported by it. And people can uh, explore that. What happens in the moment, in the present, when you feel rested in love, flowing in and flowing out? To your point, a fair amount of the things I've, I've talked about have been my own kind of reflecting about reality in which we're seeing it clearly. There is a place mm -hmm. for seeing it clearly. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. seeing reality clearly doesn't mean, oh, you're in your head about it or, mm -hmm. oh, that's so abstract and conceptual. You're, yeah, you're actually seeing it. You're, you're seeing it, including the reality. I, I was there when my father died, literally right there, watching the pulses slow and then stop in his throat. And, um, you know, it gets very real. And in the realness of it, you can come to a perspective about it that can be helpful to you. I think that's really true. Connected to that, 
it's interesting that I've become Captain Somatics over here on the podcast, but I do wonder about how much of it is driven by the body sensations associated with these things. Like mm -hmm. I think of, if I call up in my body what the existential dread or the fear of death mm. feels like, by and large, it's extremely contracted. Just it feels very tight. And if you think about feelings more of connection, which we talked about in terms of are you the wave or are you the ocean, feelings of love that you just said, love going in, love going out, what do these things feel like? Well, they feel like the opposite. They feel expansive. They feel broad. They feel big in the body. And so I think that that's one of those things that it's really valuable to pay attention to if you're in a moment of panic about something, if you're having the moment of existential dread, or if you're consider you're listening to this podcast and you're going, oh, you know, <laughs> like it's it could be worthwhile to have a moment where you think about what is my body feeling, and can I evoke a different kind of experience? Is there a way where I can take a breath or relax the physical form a bit or think about how I can move more into that stance of being expanded rather than being contracted. Mm, I think that's so good. Uh, reminds me of something Judson Brewer said on the podcast, psychiatrist who also deep meditator. And we asked him, so Judd, knowing so much about the brain and your brain, what's the takeaway for your own practice? He says, expansion rather than contraction. We have to contract sometimes to mobilize action or defend ourselves, okay? But in general, just what you said, wider, spacious, open. Totally. And that's just a good stance in life in general, right? To have that more expansive stance. And it connects pretty directly to how can we use this consideration? Well, that's something right there, right? That's a little lesson already. But connected to that, I read a uh, blog post years ago from Wait But Why, which is, I think, Tim Urban's blog, if I'm getting that correct. And the name of the blog post is The Tail End. And it was one of the most impactful things I ever read for me personally, because he basically went through an exercise of writing out in this blog post, and it's Wait But Why, so it was kind of funny, um, all of these different ways to uh, think about the amount of time that he had left in his life, like the number of uh, dumplings that he would consume for the rest of his life, or the number of Super Bowls that he would see, things like that. And then toward the end of it, he talked about relationships and how we can understand where we are in our life progression. Uh, because thinking about it relationally, like my relationship with you, Dad, by the time that I was 18 and I moved out of the house and went to college, I was already through 80%-ish of the days that I would ever spend with you. And you see people do that. Um, as they age, right, we become more distant from family. And so for most people, by the time that they hit 80, 18, 19, 20 years old, they've actually already spent the overwhelming majority of days they will ever spend with their parent, living under the same roof, being in interaction, seeing them physically. And so he was really thinking about, he sort of estimated out, okay, I see my parents about six times a year, and I think I'm going to live for or they're going to live for about this many more years. And so he just wrote it down on a sheet of paper and he X'd them all out. And then he got down and he realized, oh, wait, I'm only going to see them 50 more times or whatever it is, like actually in person. And I think that that can really cause people to, to refine their focus and go, what do I actually care? Wow, 50 more times. What do I want them to be like? And to stop just letting the pitches sail by of all these opportunities uh, to... One of the things that we were talking about when we were prepping for this conversation was um, undelivered communications yeah, and going through a process of expressing them if you got something to say because you only got 50 more shots or whatever it is. And I, I think it's a really powerful way to think about this. I thoroughly agree. You, you may also know the work of Stephen Levine, uh, mm -hmm. bless him, uh, One Year to Live. That book and, that, and the programs uh, that people sometimes teach about that Really great. And one of the sentences that definitely stopped me in my tracks was uh, along the lines of, um, at some point, all of us will have a year to live and almost none of us will know when we've crossed that line. Well, let me ask, you know, getting it real, how do you, how do you manage that you have a finite and fairly small number of interactions left uh, with mom and me? How do you how do you manage that? Wow. Well, um, I think that 
a way that most people manage it is by not having it in the forefront of my consciousness yeah. most of the time, for starters. <laughs> uh, which, you know, I just talked about avoiding death avoidance. But at the there same time, are. we we manage our emotions in a variety of different ways. If that yeah. was just like the only thing that I was holding in my mind while we were having lunch or something, it, it you know... There might be something about that that would be lovely, but there's also probably something about that that would be a bit difficult. So I think that there is a place here for a little, you know, let it move to the back burner as opposed to the front burner. But I do think it's valuable to keep it on a burner. And so maybe that's the distinction that I'm making here. More to your point. Well, I think one of the things that's really helped me is uh, feeling like I don't have any undelivered communications. Feeling like there's really not a lot that's been, that I'm going to regret when you guys are gone. I, I certainly have some regrets attached to the the passing of various family members, things I wish that I could have done, done differently or would do differently uh, given the opportunity. And that really sticks with you because there's nothing you can do. And we've talked about coming to peace with regrets and things like that in previous episodes, but nonetheless, it's very hard to shake that. Uh, so I think that one of the things that gives me a degree of peace is, is knowing that you guys know all the things that I would want to say that like, if something, you know, if you and mom were in a car accident tomorrow, it wouldn't be like there was something that I had left to say, you know? And I think that that's really helpful. Of course, I would never mm -hmm. wish for that, but it gives you a degree of peace. Yeah. So that's something that's certainly been helpful for me. I've had situations where I, I walked out of the room and I thought to myself, almost certainly, this is the last time I will see my friend in a hospital bed, say, and still I've, I've got to walk out the door. I mean, for one, things become cliches often because they're deeply true. Life is for the living. That's something that's given me comfort. Uh, live until you die, to quote you, squeeze the juice out of the orange. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the crazy ride. How improbable that you got to be here. Wow. But also I think part of it is that I feel like we squeeze the juice out of the relationship. You know, maybe that's a way of thinking about it. Like, we have had a very full relationship. So in the context of, like, me regretting your passing, I will feel deeply sad about it. I will be profoundly emotionally moved. And I'll, you know, and I'll think about it every day, every week, every whatever. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I'll be like, we did the thing. You know, we did it the right way. We got all, we got all the stuff out of it that you can get out of that relationship. Um, and so that, that gives me a degree of comfort too. And I think that one of the most powerful things that people can do is relate to this by casting themselves forward in time. Hmm. By thinking about things in terms of, okay, I'm sitting in my chair, I'm laying on my bed, whatever, I am fill in the blank, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, and I'm looking back on things, will I remember this or not? Like if you just had a, a painful interaction with a you know, not tremendously important friend, but eh, they're kind of in your life and you had an annoying interaction with them or with a boss, with a coworker, whatever, are you going to be thinking about that then? No, you're not going to be at all. It's so much of it becomes cosmic noise, it just fades into the background. Yeah. And so that's given me solace sometimes in the moment. And then at the same time, we can think about, okay, what would you be thinking about? What would you be pleased you did or displeased that you did? What were, you know, what are some of the wishes that you might have had for how things could have turned out differently? And then you get to wake up and I get to wake up as a 34 year old. You know, after doing that reflection, it's a pretty powerful tool. So I found that very clarifying for me. And it, man, it is real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we've had Frank Ostaseski on here, and uh, we've talked with other people who have a lot of background with death and dying and hospice work and or grief and loss related to it. And I can say from my own experience that to walk out of that room and you know, and you know that they know that you know that this will be the last time. And yet they wish you well, you've got to walk out of the room. You've you got to get your car, you got to get home, you got dinner to make, you know, it's reality. They're getting tired. The nurses need to come in and do a procedure or something. And yet it's still, wow. 
It is really heavy duty. And so it's very important as we talk about ways to hold this and ways to not suffer it. You can have pain, emotional pain, but you need not suffer so much in how you face your own death and that of other people. Uh, and still, it's the real deal, right? One thing if, to kind of bring up related to it is um, using finitude, you know, the limitation, the fact that you just numerically, and I'm here you go for us, I'm going to be looking for it. If you and I are going to have, I don't know, 40 more face-to-face -face interactions, I'm keeping score. I'm, I think it's going to be more than 40 for us. We're, we live pretty close, so we're probably okay. But, but still, you know, I'm taking away from this. I'm going to think about that business of uh, how many more interactions am I going to have with key people? And without being burdened by it, can we use that to be 1% more wholehearted? Get more right? juice. Yeah. Not even 10%. You don't even need to be 10% happier. You can be just 1% more wholehearted uh, in that interaction. Here's a weird question for you. I think that where a lot of people suffer is not around so much what they've been ungiven, the, what they have not been given enough. They're, that's real. But a lot of it boils down to being obstructed in what they could give to that other person, that extra 1%, let's say, of effort in that interaction or wholeheartedness. And what do you find that people really want to give in this life to bring meaning and value to it and a sense of contentment that I gave all I could. Yeah, I guess I really orient toward that in thinking about my own efforts. This question of did I make the most for it or did I make the most of it is, is very real for me, for sure. To extend your party metaphor, I think I was just dealt like an amazing hand of cards beyond narrow things like the nature of my family, which is fantastic, or the nature of my own capabilities in this moment of time with the situation that I was put into and this moment in humanity and, you know, so on and so on and so on. It's just like, oh my God, right? And so there's a part of me that that feels like it's very, that there is a living up to that to be done. Inside of me, I think that I carry that story around a little bit, which is interesting, I guess. And I think that that's one of the things that I could see myself really having regrets about, looking back over the course of my life from the perspective of an older person. I, I could see that being a source of discomfort and pain for me. But that's how I relate to it. Other people might relate to it a bit differently. So yeah, I could feel stymied in what I was able to, to create or give to other people or produce. But I think a lot of it becomes a very, I mean... Man, uh, you know, the Roman Empire was great, and it's also not around anymore. It all, it all fades to dust. We can be pretty individualized about this, you know what I mean? I think that when, when the, uh, the end of things is staring you in the face, you're, you're really pretty self-centered, which is okay. Like, this is your ego identity. This is the one you got. And I think that it's okay to think about these things in terms of what is going to, like, give you succor from all of this as opposed to thinking in terms of like oh i was unable to deliver this thing to this other person um of course a lot of people have unrequited desires and unrequited wants and needs which can be attached to that i feel like i had this gift inside of me to give to the world and i could never manifest it fully that's true for me to a degree but i think that the angle on it is much more about like for me did i do everything that i wanted and yeah, that's like a little self-centered, but aren't we all? Two things are true right next to each other. On the one hand, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, most <laughs> contributions, most people, you know, it's like pouring a bucket of water into a river. A hundred feet downstream, it's as if that bucket had not been poured in. And yet the bucket was a real bucket. All the water in it was real. And the the person who's doing the pouring cared about it. And so that's the other side of it. Everything matters in a sense. And I think about uh, wisdom traditions of different kinds. And there is almost no 
significant wisdom tradition, including secular ones, like in folklore, for example, in which the young person ends up with the wizard or the wise being or the dragon is talking with them or the pulsing ball of light out of which a voice comes. They never just say, yeah, don't wor just don't worry. You live fast, die young, leave a good looking corpse. It's all fine. Don't worry about it. Nobody says that. They all say, don't get too weird about it. Don't get too pressed and contracted about it. But, you know, wake up and realize today is an incredible gift. You could do so much with your life today. What are you going to do today? What are you going to do the best that you can do today? Here, if it's okay for us, I'd like to quote from the Dalai Lama in this little mini hanging that's been sitting in my bedroom or now your mom's bedroom um, for many, many years. For the visual for YouTube, <laughs> here's the little hanging. This is what it says. It's titled, A Precious Human Life. Every day, think as you wake up. Today, I am fortunate to have woken up. I am alive. I have a precious human life. I am not going to waste it. I am going to use all my energies to develop myself, to expand my heart out to others, to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. I am going to have kind thoughts toward others. I am not going to get angry or think badly about others. I am going to benefit others as much as I can. Now, people might vary those words. I'm not offering it as a pronouncement that we should all think this way. But you can hear in those words a certain aspirational quality that's really down to earth. You know, manage our impacts on others, look for ways to benefit them, uh, be grateful for the gift of waking up yet another day, right? And we can't control results very well at all, but we can sure you know, influence our process, what we bring to bear. Do we enter life with a whole heart? Do we admit fault? Do we clean it up? Do we learn? Uh, do we approach others with good intentions? Uh, do we try? <laughs> yeah, and and to be clear, um, I totally agree. And what I'm what I'm concerned about as a 96 year old, my future self, is some version of did i really do all that i could which is in some ways a selfish question and in some ways isn't because i think that where a lot of people find in that do all that i could is fulfillment you know was i really fulfilled and most people find fulfillment not by pursuing entirely selfish ends they mostly find it by doing things for other people on some way or another ways large and small and so, yeah, I think that those are great pathways to ultimately feeling fulfilled. And I also think that it's good for us to have a real transparent realization of end of the day, it's about do you feel good about it? It's not about does your mom feel good about it or your dad feel good about it or your pastor feel good about it or anything. It's about do you feel good about it? Because a lot of people are living their lives for others fundamentally. That's probably one of the saddest experiences you can have when you're land there? Like, did you live the life that you actually wanted to lead? And that can be, I think, very clarifying. One of the things I want to ask you here, Dad, is that there are probably a lot of people who are listening to this podcast right now who are picking age. My age, 34, or they're 44, or they're 74. And they're hearing us talk about fulfillment and what it means to be at the end of a life and wow, are you going to look back on it and go, I squeezed the juice out of it or I didn't. And they're thinking to themselves, I don't know if I did. And now I don't feel great about it. What do you say to them? This question really gets at so many deep recurring themes in mental health and being well, broadly. How do we sort out what is the proper learning as we judge our view? How do we clarify our own view? And so, for example, it may well be that a person today will look back and they'll think, you know, I absorbed a whole bunch of 
shoulds and rules and standards and cultural agendas and capitalistic media framing, whatever it all is. And a whole bunch of that's hooey. So I'm going to throw out that bathwater. I'm going to toss it. I've had it. I'm free. I love it. And I've had series of things like that, you know, uh, my uh, different kind of, you know, I, you know, standards for how I should be. I realized that's crazy, Rick. It's just burdening for you. Forget it. So I tossed out the bathwater. But then there's the baby. And maybe there's no baby in that water. Maybe when you really look closely and you go, based on my own core values, what I really care about, my own wisdom about living this life, I've done a, it's been great so far. And uh, 98% is good enough <laughs> or something like that. There's no perfect on the one hand. On the other hand, if a person today, whether they're 36 or 46 or 76 or 96, is, is feeling the truth in their heart of hearts, that there's something important that's left for them. What can you do today about that? I've gotten more compassionate uh, as I've aged. I've also gotten kind of tougher-minded in terms of seeing reality and seeing cause and effect and, and being clear. Like, well, whatever the past has been, you can't change it. You could change how you think about it, but you can't change it itself. And what can you do today that will help your life be a little bit better? And if a person doesn't make that effort today, okay, well, are you going to make it tomorrow? There's, there's a kind of realness to that. Now, where it gets interesting, what do you do if in your heart of hearts, your genuine soul, you look back and there are things, and I've got them, where you took a bad turn or you indulge yourself in a way that hurts some people? Or you just chickened out. You lost your nerve. You played small. You were cowardly, maybe. And I'm using words that might sound judgmental. I mean them just descriptively and factually. What do you do then? And, and you'll never get it back. You know, you could have asked them to marry you and you never did. And your life would have been different. You could have applied for that job. You could have, you know, stayed longer, left sooner, something, you know. You could have avoided a risk and you didn't. And here you are. That's a big deal. As people move more toward the end of their life, there are these natural processes of life reflection that occur. And, you know, my own experience with that, both professionally and personally, is that it's very important to honor it and to not push it away. As, as you say, people often will push that away because they're just very afraid of what they'll think and feel. But if you push it away, it's always hovering around the edges. It's like a visitor who just won't leave. The only way to get them to leave is to invite them into the room, hang out with them a bit, and then it's time to go. So uh, being big enough and brave enough to really look back and go, okay, there, there are things I can't undo, but I can learn from them today. That itself gives you dignity, self-respect, inner peace. There's still the sorrow you know, that you did it. There's the pain of that, but you don't need to suffer it in part because you recognize, I learned from it. I'm not going to do that kind of thing again. I regret it immensely. Uh, what's the phrase from AA, as you said? <laughs> you know, Everything is AA, starting with acceptance. Fearless and searching moral inventory is, yep. I think, what you're, what you're thinking of. You yeah. read my mind, as usual. Yeah. So, yeah. And when you know you've done that, there's a freedom in it and a peacefulness yeah. in it. No, that's that's what I come back to too. And just being real about, look, we we all have regrets. We're talking about regret here. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are two pieces to it. The first piece is acceptance and acknowledgement of the presence yeah. of regret. If you don't have an existential lens or a moral lens or a spiritual lens or any of those kinds of things, then I could understand why somebody might just defer all of this endlessly. You just literally defer it until you die, and then you never have to think about it. Oh, okay, you know, that, that's a way to be. But my, my sense for this is that even people who have none of those lenses, if they're not a total sociopath, they get toward the end of their life and they start to feel the bill of this deferment come, come due. Just in the quality of life, the thoughts that pop up in their brain, the subconscious uh, sadness or or anxiety, or impulses, or urges. I, I really do think that the bill on this comes comes due for people. Um, 
And so there's a way in which the acceptance of whatever it is, the regret, can be remarkably freeing for us, for starters. And then alongside that, this other dimension of, well, okay, let's just say you only have a month left or a year left or whatever. Well, it's better than nothing, right? You, you can do something, even if it feels very small. Like, um, you know, to, to speak personally about this for a second, uh, I, I started dancing kind of late. So I started dancing when I was 18-ish, 19 years old. And uh, when I first got into doing it, there was a lot of messaging around, you were supposed to start this 10 years ago if you wanted to do it seriously. And I was like, well, okay, but here I am today. What can I do? And then I got good enough. Did I, did I get as good as I would have been if I had started at eight? No, but like I got good enough. And I certainly got good enough to do the things that I wanted to do with it. And uh, you just see that over and over again in life. Like, the time to start a podcast was 10 years before we started our podcast. The time to, you know, do whatever is always five years ago. So if you just abide by that standard, you're never going to do anything because you yeah. always should have done it five years ago. And yeah. um, it reminds me of this great line that you uh, shared with me, Dad, which was from a friend of yours, which is the whole idea of when you were wrestling with essentially doing your PhD program. And uh, you were doing this whole back and forth about, oh, I'm going to be 35 or whatever it was when I get done. Like, oh, my God. And your friend was just like, well, are you planning on being 35? And you were like, yeah. And he said, well, you want to be a doctor or not? And I was like, <laughs> oh, you know, so there is something in that that could be remarkably clarifying, I think. Oh, that's great. The age was 40, by 40, the way. 40, and okay, I'm happy 40. to say that um, I got uh, licensed soon before I turned 40. Nice. And after six years of indentured servitude as a psych assistant. But yeah, anyway, seriously. It, it added up. I think that for many people, when they do life review to get really, really old, there can be a dawning sense of contentment. On the other hand, let's be clear, the I think, I believe it's true in America, the biggest demographic group that's living in poverty are old people. And as you age, there's a lot of grieving over the friends you're losing, family members you're losing, capacities. Uh, you get pushed into these sort of far, you know, like backwater places often. Um, you're dealing with pain. You, your mind is going maybe, you know, it's not a pretty picture. That said, people can often, they kind of step back. It's like the big picture. Hey, nobody. Like, sure, let's take a look at a handful of people. We look at them and go, wow, what a great life. And it's incredibly rare, maybe, to just hit all the bells. It's like the, the, the whole idea of scoring your life just falls away increasingly. It just seems ridiculous. And uh, you become more and more present in the present, which really, really helps. So we've talked about a lot here in terms of relating to this and integrating it into our experience and different ways to think about it and all of that. Um, but very practically, as we come to the end here, I'd love to leave people with a few practices, ways to think about this that maybe um, feel a bit more practical or, or everyday. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I would say if this is a front and center topic for a person, maybe because they've gotten a terminal diagnosis or something like it, Look for wisdom of people who are really have expertise and wisdom in this territory beyond yours and mine. Uh, Franco Staseski, um, his book, The Five Invitations, Stephen Levine, A Year to Live, uh, other sources. Uh, if a person is coming at this within a frame of a particular religion, looking for counsel and support in that frame that's meaningful to that person. Uh, I have family members, uh, cousins who are very clear as, as Christians and their kind of Christianity uh, that they are going to meet their loved ones in heaven and their own children will eventually join them there someday. And that's their way in. Fine. Okay. So that's one part of it. Look for wisdom and expertise about dealing with this. Uh, second, understandably, the body doesn't want to go generally. And around that then can be a lot of thoughts and fears. As you say, we're in a death avoiding culture. So that which we push away tends to fester and grow in the shadows. So opening up this whole consideration, read obituaries, uh, spend time with really old people, 
don't look away. See what it's like. There are deep meditations, certainly in the Buddhist tradition, I suspect elsewhere, where people go to uh, grave sites, uh, charnel grounds, and just kind of get the realness of it. You know, whatever. Help yourself to unpack this so it's not this big, stuck weight on you. Because it's one of the big ones. So honor it. You know, ramp up your engagement with it, your resourcing of yourself around it uh, in, to do justice to the magnitude of this particular topic. Practical, sorry, <laughs> but get your affairs in order. You know, just simple stuff like get an advanced health directive or think through how you would handle certain scenarios or take practical steps and know that you've, you've done a reasonable job given your limitations in your life. Just what can you do? Be thoughtful about your health. Uh, there's a lot that comes due when you get older, uh, and there's a lot of benefit you can do for yourself in your 30s, 40s, and 50s that you're going to be very glad about in your 80s or 90s. Prepare for it. Set yourself up. That's important. Another is to find that middle place that's really true to you, where you push away the bathwater. <laughs> You know, and you stop comparing yourself to Albert Einstein or, you know, somebody else throughout history. You just, you just let that go. And you look back in your life, and I think it's helpful to bring a certain humor to it. I, I think of the Grateful Dead line, the band, the Grateful Dead, for you youngsters. Uh, what a long, strange trip it's been. It's weird. All these things happen to us. They push us around, different currents. Uh, if we're a wave, there are all kinds of other waves bumping into us. Wow, you know, kind of lighten up about it uh, and make sure that you're just dropping as best you can, throwing out the bathwater of pressure on yourself to some, be somebody you never really were meant to be or, you know, manifest in some kind of way or underestimate the huge effect of luck and random events that are not your fault or your virtue. They just, you caught a good wave or you got swamped in a bad one, you know. On the one hand. On the other hand, live until you die. Every second is an opportunity for presence and learning and serving and growing and enjoying. Every second, even if in that second is some pain or difficulty or upset, right? And just, it's the wake-up call. There's all these teachers, you know, Carlos Castaneda quoting Don Juan, whatever is actually true about all that, imagining the death is on your left shoulder or whichever shoulder it was, uh, there, it's going to happen. How can you be guided by that? How can you live with dignity and bravery and courage uh, every single day? Uh, live well, meanwhile. That's a, for me a real adage. Live well, meanwhile. So that's my advice. That's my advice. And be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. For many, you know, the last days and years even are often quite uncomfortable for many people. Um, I've had friends who've done a lot of work in hospice and they say, you know, people sometimes can have these sentimental fantasies of what it's really like for the people going out. And it is that way sometimes. I hope it is that way for you and Laurel and Jan and me and for everybody really. And it may not be exactly like that. It may not be like that. It wasn't like this pleasant, long anticipated, death in your bed at home, surrounded by loved ones, you know, something happened. And I, I try to live actually, honestly, Forrest, in a way that if the lights go out in the next second, I'm okay with it. And, you know, to be to be okay with that and to, to know it might not be pretty, it may not be your sentimental fantasy, it's not all rose, rosy and, you know, Hallmark Hardy, and yet it's real and then you're done. And you, you're still okay. You're still okay. You're still okay. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, as good a note as any to close this episode on. It's a tricky one to put a bow on. But we just talked about a lot of material here, and this one was a little looser than some of our other episodes because we came into it not quite knowing what we were going to talk about in a lot of ways, but knowing that it was an important topic and one that we should spend some time with. So I'm glad that we did, and I'm glad that we took today's episode to talk about relating to death and dying. We began today's episode by talking about accepting both life's length and its brevity. Life can feel really long while you're living it. The days just go and go and go, and it seems like they will endlessly follow themselves. 
But the reality is that the average life, at least for a man like me living in the United States, is about 80 years, or 960 months, or 4,160 weeks, or about 29,000 days. And when you lay it all out in front of you, it can start to feel pretty short. And we have a, have a mind and live in a culture that doesn't really want to talk about death very much. Understandably, it can cause the panicky animal that lives inside of the body to freak out more than a little bit. We have a lot of cultural content connected to death and to death avoidance, wanting to live forever, not wanting to live next to a cemetery, feeling a little awkward or uncomfortable around people who are very old or headed toward the end of their life. And these things are unfortunate because death can be a wonderful teacher in a lot of different ways. And it can certainly refine and focus our attention on the things that really matter to us. Rick talked about three things that have helped him soften fears or concerns about the reality of his own death. The first is almost a, a very Rickian scientific exploration of the ways in which, from an evolutionary point of view, we just have to live long enough to reproduce and raise our kids. Anything beyond that, and you're in bonus territory. And alongside that, just an acceptance that death is a natural part of the life process, and that for change to occur, the old has to make way in some fashion for the new. Rick then talked about feeling a lot of gratitude and appreciation for the wonderful party of life, for the improbability of life itself, for the strange manifestation of this world as a whole, and appreciation for the nature of a nervous system that allows us to have experiences. I mean, wow, this whole thing is really remarkable if you spend even more than a couple seconds thinking about it. And then finally, we talked about the nature of the egoic self altogether and how, yes, we are an individual wave, but we are also the ocean as a whole. And relaxing our attachment to the wave and increasing our connection to the feeling of the ocean can be really helpful. We then spent the bulk of the episode talking about the view from the porch. Looking back over your life as a person who's nearing the end of it, what will you be grateful for? What will you have wished that you did differently? How will you think about this uh, current unpleasant interaction that you're having with a coworker or a family member or a friend? Well, most of it fades into the background, so what is really going to matter to you? And one way into that is by thinking about the limited time that we have with the people that we truly love and care about. How many more interactions are you going to get to have with somebody realistically, and how do you want them to be? And yes, there can be a degree of fear or existential dread attached to that kind of an inquiry, but it really allows us to focus on what truly matters and what we really care about. Speaking personally, I think that one of my great regrets would be if I felt like I didn't get everything that I could out of this remarkable hand of cards that I've been dealt. And not everyone's going to feel that way. Not everyone's going to feel like they were dealt a great hand of cards. But even so, we can all get what we can out of this life. We can squeeze the juice out of the orange, to use a phrase that, I don't know why I like that phrase so much, but it just kind of stuck in my brain one day and I keep saying it. We can really maximize what we get from life. And I think that all of us have an opportunity, almost regardless of where we are in life's progression, to get a little more out of it, whatever that means to you. And something that's been very freeing for me is releasing an attachment to other people's views of time, of the schedule, of what you're supposed to have accomplished by a given age. Because the best time to start something is always going to be five years ago, right? But that is what it is, and we can appreciate and accept that while also going, okay, but I'm going to do the best that I can today, even if I've only got a couple more todays left. And hey, maybe especially if I've only got a couple more todays left. That's it for today's episode. If you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to it wherever you're listening to it on. And hey, you can also support us through Patreon if you'd like to do that. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast, and for just a few dollars a month, you can support the show, and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. Also, if you have a second, please leave a rating and a positive review of the podcast. It really helps us out. Until next time, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.